this next section we're going to be studying Baroque art. Probably the most important thing about it is that the definition of the Baroque comes from actually the 18th century, the 1760s. And it was really a way of describing an art form that in the 1700s they found kind of corrupt. And uh, probably by the 18th and 19th centuries, the way that we were looking at Baroque art was that it was a corruption of the old Renaissance ideals. So you can see by this definition, it literally means an irregularly shaped pearl. Some of the main qualities of the Baroque are really evidenced or you can really experience them by looking at the Vatican. Because remember we talked about the Vatican being begun around the 1500s. And what happens is that it gets worked on almost for nearly 200 years after that. And so when we study the, the Vatican, we look at the facade and you look at the building itself, it's a really good example of the Baroque style because it has a whole bunch of the qualities of Baroque art. So what I'm suggesting is if you look at the front of the building, you'll see that it's kind of two-tone. There are these arms that are this colonnade that come out that's an oval shape, it's not a circle. It tends to be an irregular use of, of uh, classical forms, and we'll be studying that a little bit more in depth when we look at the front of the building. And even the dome itself, even though Michelangelo designed it, and you know, I guess in a way he was a Mannerist architect, the dome is this, um, it's an oval, it's an egg shape, and that kind of is a Baroque kind of convention as well. So we're gonna be studying this a little bit more in depth, and the Vatican really evidences this an awful lot. So let's take a closer look at how the redesign of the Vatican in the 1600s really is a good example of the Baroque style, especially in architecture. If you look at these plans, remember that we talked about Bramante and Michelangelo in the beginning of the 1500s was the first designers for it. And when Bramante designs the the first floor plan of the uh, St. Peter's, of the redesign or rebuild of the St. Peter's, he designs it more or less as a symmetrical central plan that's like a snowflake. And over time, the facade of it gets elongated. And eventually, the elongation by Carlo Moderno gets added to by another architect named Jean Lorenzo Bernini that we're going to be looking at in just a minute. So the front of the facade that we're looking at here is a really good example of the Baroque style of architecture. First off, because it exhibits the physical qualities of it. So let's talk about it first from a sort of physical or formal point of view, which is, are you seeing how that's kind of two-tone? It's using two different colors. So that's one thing that makes the facade very Baroque is that usually in Baroque uh, sculpture and design and interior design actually in the Baroque style, what you usually have is uh, different materials that are being used and different colors. We often refer to that as polychromy or polychromy. The next thing about it is you can kind of take it into a little bit uh, more in depth into the formal level and take a look at the styles of architecture that are being used on the facade by Carlo Moderno. And uh, what you'll see is usually when you think of a classical building, it's a straight shot across. But in this instance, when you look at the facade of the front of the building, what you see is it kind of jogs in and out. It's not a straight flat plane all the way across. The next thing about the Baroque style here, as, as evidenced by Carlo Moderno's uh, architecture, is that you have things like the pediment, which is that triangular section, is put below another entablature. So it's almost like you have this Parthenon-like structure that's just a sort of window dressing or facade on the front, and then you have a second level to it. Other things that are very Baroque about this design is you have columns that are irregularly placed. So instead of having a sort of even sequence of columns like you would see, for instance, on the Parthenon or even on the front of the Pantheon. What you have here is a, a sequence of columns that combines pilasters, which are flat and squared off columns, with engaged columns and with columns on the front. They're also bunched up in irregular groupings of, of sometimes it's a sequence of one with a triumphal arch and then a, another pilaster. 
and then you have these sort of niches that are kind of similar to what we saw in the library at San Lorenzo, and then doubled up columns with Corinthian tops on them. So those are some of the main qualities. Now, if you move up to the top, you see the pediment above that entablature, and that's beneath another entablature. Then you have a series of sculptures that are placed along the top of it. You would call those acrotiri. And um, you see that they're sort of irregularly placed in the, uh, in the facade of the building. So all of this stuff, if you think about it, relates back to mannerism when we're looking at the, uh, the Olympic theater. Now the next thing is the last sort of innovation or big design change on the uh, Vatican is that a guy named Bernini came along and he designs this sort of colonnade that we see in this plan along the front of it and makes it look literally like a skeleton key. Bernini built these in 1637 or designed it in 1637 and he kind of thought of it as a uh, as almost the arms of St. Peter's coming out to greet the faithful to worship. And so what we see here is a coin that was uh, commissioned that was struck to commemorate the, the rebuilding of it. And you have these arms that are reaching out and they are an oval shape. And I guess if you were God or a space alien flying above, you would get the symbol right away that it was meant to be keys. Now the handprint of, of um, Bernini is all over the Vatican and he gets inside the building, he gets on the outside. And probably because he was this guy who he was a little bit like Leonardo, a little bit like Raphael. He was very popular. He uh, knew how to navigate court life at the uh, at the Pope's court. He also was very charming and a very interesting kind of guy. And he was even very handsome. So Bernini is this guy who becomes almost like a designer or in a. Uh, Think of him almost like a stylist for the Baroque era in the 1600s. And he worked mainly for the Borghese family, but he did work for some others. And when we see this aerial shot, you can kind of see what his vision and how it was uh, sort of come together. I think an interesting little component to this is that after the arms were built, these arms of St. Peter's were built, they actually put an obelisk in the center. And I think it's a way of recontextualizing the obelisk and saying that we have some control over ancient history and that we even have control over ancient Rome who had control over Egypt. And I think those are some cool ideas about uh, how you have a schema and correction in terms of the symbols or iconography used as things get updated. The interior of the building has all of these structures that you've probably heard of before, like for instance, Michelangelo's Pieta is a sculpture that's placed in there. And, um, but probably the things that are most important for the Baroque era are what's called Bernini's canopy, which is also sometimes referred to as the baldacchino. And then there at the end, at the very apse, and we don't see it in this diagram here, is something called the Chair of St. Peter or the Cathedra Petri that we're going to be studying a little bit more in depth. So let's take a look at the interior and talk about what's called Bernini's Canopy, which is also called the Baldacchino. And it's built in the center, right underneath the dome, in the crossing of the church, over the remains or the tomb of St. Peter. And this is symbolic because it's meant to be a commemorative device that's that's meant to focus you on the role of St. Peter as the patriarch and the beginning pope of the Holy Roman Church, the Catholic Church. This is what it looks like inside the church and what you can see um, is that there is this weird bronze canopy that's placed into the center over the crossing of the, uh, the nave and the transept and it looks like literally a bronze tent. There's a saying that um, the tour guides will, will say to you when you go to visit St. Peter's and they'll, what they'll say is the, um, whatever the Barbari barbarians didn't destroy, the Barberini did. And the Barberini family are the family that were responsible. They were the papal family at the time who had hired Bernini to work on the, uh, the Vatican and to build this canopy or baldacchino. The term baldacchino literally comes from the idea that for the Italians, tents came from Baghdad. And so the word for uh, Baghdad in Italian at that time was baldacco. And they also used it interchangeably for the word tent. 
And so when you use the term baldacchino, it's almost like making a, uh, a nickname or a, a diminutive nickname for someone uh, in which you, for instance, the name Miguel and you call someone Miguelito. It's kind of a way of kind of making it cutesy. And so the baldacchino is a nickname for this baldaco, this big tent that was over the crossing and the remains of St. Peter's, and it's meant to commemorate it. It is cast out of bronze, but it has a series of gold leaf on it. So it's two-tone, and that's one of the main qualities that I just discussed with you about what the Baroque style of architecture, sculpture, and painting often is, is that you often have a lot of colors being used in polychromy. Just behind the baldacchino, and we'll study this in a little bit, is called the Chair of St. Peter's, and you see these sort of... Um, this flare of light coming out with a stained glass window and there's a chair beneath that. And we'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. The baldacchino itself really exhibits Baroque qualities because of the columns, first of all, are twisting. And that's one of the qualities that you can really think about as being a typical Baroque kind of convention, that they can't just leave a straight column up and down. What they have to do is overly ornament it, almost make it like a wedding cake. So what they do with the baldacchino is they have these sort of ornamented curled uh, horns or, or curled uh, columns that kind of look almost like the horns of some kind of ram that terminate in a complex design that looks a little bit like a, a composite column, but it, it has a little bit more sort of flair to it. <clears throat> The top of the baldacchino has a series of sculptures on it, and these sculptures are literally Nike figures or Nike figures, which are winged victory. We, in, our, in our culture, we kind of think of them as angels because they're winged mess, messengers. Then you also see these putti, or these sort of cupids or angels, in the center of it. And what they have and what they're sort of carrying in and floating in is something that looks like the Pope's crown or the papal tiara. If you look a little bit more closely, it looks kind of like a beehive, but it's actually a, a crown that we have studied, remember, when we looked at Durer and we looked at printmaking and we talk, talked about Martin Luther, that it was a way, it's an emblem of St. Peter, and it's an emblem of papal rule or papal power is that crown. And so we have these cupids flying in with this crown or this papal tiara, and they are literally crowning St. Peter. And we're going to see this imagery a couple of times uh, in Bernini's work. Underneath that, these tassels that are hanging off, they have the uh, these bees hanging off of the tassels or our emblems on the tassels, and they're kind of similar to when we were studying Michelangelo and those acorns that represented the Della Rovere family, which were, uh, I think, Julius's family and were his coat of arms. Well, that's what Bernini is doing here, is he's actually putting the Barberini coat of arms on these tassels, on these bronze tassels that are hanging off these sort of banners on the side. I think it also might relate to some mythology that has to do with saints. And what I'm talking about is uh, they used to say that if you would uh, um, open up the tomb of a saint or a martyr, their remains would never putrefy or rot and that bees would be clustered around the mouths and the eyes because uh, the mortal remains of a saint were so pure that they literally would smell sweet and the bees would be attracted to it. If we pass through the baldacchino and look at the apse on the end, you'll see this sort of flare of light and there's actually a chair that's elevated by four sculptures at the four corners. So let's zoom in a little bit on that. That chair is called the Chair of St. Peter's. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Cathedra Patri, which just is Latin for, um, the cathedral is, is literally a Latin word for chair, and that's why we call cathedrals uh, the seats of the church. And this chair that is the Chair of St. Peter's, and this chair that's the Chair of St. Peter's is Bernini's design probably taken from a chair that they literally had in storage that they thought was the original throne of St. Peter's. And so he designs or casts a bronze model of it. And it's meant to 
be uh, an elevated throne in which almost the spirit of St. Peter resides over his cathedral. Because remember that uh, when Jesus was passing down his sort of earthly power, he laid his hands on Peter and said, on this rock, I will build my church. And therefore, Peter is the original pope, and they, they want to extend that further down. Bernini, in some ways, if you look at this design, you could construe or sort of extrapolate that he might have been a little bit of an egomaniac because if you look at it, you have this stained glass window with a dove bursting through it. And the stucco or plaster angels that are also gold leafed are sort of around that stained glass window. And then these wooden uh, bars that are sort of oozing out with the sculptures over the architecture that was already built there are meant to be rays of light. So what I want you to think about is that he's actually doing something that is very Baroque or irregular. In a way, he's coloring outside of the lines. He's extending the influence of his sculpture past the confines of the architecture that's in the St. Peter's. Then this sort of cloud-like plaster structure oozes down and, and over the architecture and terminates onto the chairs itself and uh, we'll look at the uh, close-up of the chair in a second. And so what's happening is he's making a, a sort of stage set. And I want you to think about the fact that, for instance, the Globe Theater was really established around 1600, and there were theaters throughout Europe at this point in time, and we had already looked at one. So this is a theatrical stage set that's meant to be counter-reformation. It's counter to a lot of the main ideas that we had studied before, where he's pushing buttons dramatically to make you see how important St. Peter is. It's almost the opposite or reverse of what's going on in, in the northern parts of Europe, in Germany, Holland, and, and Belgium at this point in time. At the four corners of the chairs are these bishops, more or less, who are holding up the chair almost magically, and they are announcing and gesticulating and, and being uh, kind of dramatic. And what I want you to also see is that, again, we have these mixtures of materials where we have bronze and gold leaf. You have this flowing drapery that's not just standard wet drapery that we would find in Renaissance art, but drapery that's kind of over the top. The twisting and turn, turning gestures of this bishop are also important. If you zoom in on the chair a little bit and you see just above the back of the chair, you'll also see that same design element that we saw in the Baldacchino where you have these two cupids or angels that are holding a papal tiara up and they are offering this crown onto sort of the invisible St. Peter that would be seated on this throne. So let's kind of look at the structure of how this is organized and how that relates to the symbolism of this chair of St. Peter. At the base of it, at the four corners, you have these four guys who are basically bishops. And they are somehow magically elevating this chair up. It's almost like it's a rocket chair that's being lifted up, and it's surrounded by clou clouds. And as the chair is being elevated, you have these two cupids that are placing this crown on the imaginary St. Peter. So at the base, you have sort of our world, but the clergy who are, who are in our world, then St. Peter who is being elevated up. And as you move up, what you start to see is the things that are even more important. You have a representation of heaven in a way with these rays of light. And light for the Baroque era is a symbolic representation of God and God's enlightenment. And then in the center of that ray of light is a stained glass window that has the Holy Spirit, which is a dove bursting through, and that's above everything else, which is God and God the Father and the, and the Trinity.